Welcome everyone to the Change Starts Your Podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. And this week is a lighthearted, fun, but uh, inspirational conversation with my new friend, Shannon Olson. Shannon was a second grade teacher for 15 years. And while teaching, she got inspired by um, creating resources for her class, you know, supplemental resources for her class, but also sharing them within her school and someone encouraged her to consider checking out teachers pay teachers and instead of that she decided to create her own website life between summers where she could share great resources with teachers all across the world and so she is someone who is a giver and you'll see it you can tell right away when you talk to her she's just so sincere she's so loving um but she just wants to give the um, talents and blessings that she has to as many people as humanly possible and so we spend time talking about that but also she's written two books that uh, we spend time a great deal of time talking about today which is our class as a family and our latest book our school as a family and i find them you know even as, even as a former high school educator i find them to be incredibly powerful for kids of all ages in terms of helping to create name the culture you want to create as a family in a classroom and then be about that culture i know that sounds vague but the the picture book that she's created really breaks it down and then as you all have heard a number of times i've talked about uh, my custodian from my high school days and my middle school and high school days who really impacted me in ways that I didn't fully understand for another 10, 20 years after I graduated high school. And when I, I've taken that with me to every part of my educational journey and recognizing the importance of every person, not just the teaching staff or the administrators, but every person from folks who work in lunchroom, from the custodian, the bus drivers, to everybody that touches our kids has a an ability to make a life-changing relationship and impact on every kid. And so Shannon is someone who is about this work. Shannon is someone who is obviously trying to be a, a thought leader in this space. This book, Our School as a Family, is one that I would say anyone listening should definitely check out, but it's also something that you might want to use to bring to your entire school community or entire district. So it's a great conversation. Again, it's, it's not too long. It's, it's uh, lighthearted, inspirational, and you know, you'll see why I'm excited for you to listen to Shannon. As always, if you're a subscriber, thank you for subscribing. If you're not, um, please join us in subscribing. It helps us continue to grow our impact. Uh, but most importantly, if you hear something that Shannon shares today, there's a teacher in your life or a school administrator in your life that you really think could be inspired by Shannon's work, please share this podcast with them or share Shannon's uh, Life Between Summers contact information with her because I just, um, you'll see, she's just a, an amazingly loving, lighthearted person. So enjoy this episode. Thanks for listening. All right, Shannon, it is so excited. I'm, I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for making time for us. Um, as you know, the question that we start with everybody is who are you and what do you love about what you do? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here with you. Um, again, my name is Shannon Olson and family is a big part of who I am. So I should probably just start by saying I'm a wife. I'm a mom of two girls. Um, big part of my identity too. I was a second grade teacher for 15 years and very recently, in these past couple of years, I've now transitioned full-time to creating materials and picture books for the elementary classroom. And I also do author visits with classes and schools a couple times a week. Um, you asked what I love about what I do. Um, I think when I first became a teacher, I always thought about helping to make a positive contribution within my own classroom. And what I really love now about what I do um, since creating things for teachers and students is I really love knowing that I'm now also making a positive contribution beyond just the bubble of one classroom. I feel like I get to now be in multiple classrooms and I don't always get to see it um, or hear about it, but it's just great knowing that things that I've helped create are being used in classrooms all around the world. It's the coolest feeling. Yeah, that has to be actually surreal, right? Because you think about when you first became a teacher and you're looking, I mean, awesome. You know, uh, some of the best teachers that I know, and I was taught when I was a new teacher was beg, borrow and steal the best ideas out there. And so 
now, I mean, you've built it up over a long time. The people are like using your stuff to help them get off the ground or to build the, the culture or impact that they're, that you've always wanted to build. I mean, how crazy is that for you? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think when you said (laughs) surreal, that's the right word. I mean, for, you know, the past over a decade, I've just been adding to my own teaching bag of tricks, just gathering from different areas in education. You know, you get inspired by certain things, you might take certain things, tweak it to make it your own, or best fit the needs of your own students. So did you always know you wanted to be a teacher? Because I was kind of a late bloomer. I decided like the end of college education was my path. But is this something that's been in your heart for a long time? I completely relate to you on that. Um, I'm actually one of those people that didn't know that I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, I'm actually, I'm the oldest of five, um, a blended family. So I have step siblings, half siblings, siblings. And um, so I've known I always loved kids and I always imagined myself doing something in my career with kids. Um, At a very young age, the first thing I can remember wanting to be was actually a pediatrician, Um, but turns out science turned out to be one of my weakest subjects. I can't even stand the sight of blood, so (laughs) there's that. Um, So I actually, um, I didn't even really consider teaching all growing up. I never really considered myself a strong public speaker. So I always thought of, oh, the teacher's at the front of the room, they're in front of everybody. I couldn't do that. And so, um, but later when I was a freshman in college, my youngest sister, she was in third grade at the time. And um, my mom and I took her to her open house, you know, at the end of the year where you meet the teacher and they show you all around their classroom. And I just remember having that feeling of just feeling at home, being there in the classroom. I was kind of looking around the walls thinking, I could do this. I could see myself being here every day in a classroom. And so, you know, I added on a minor in education to my English degree. I took a year off uh, before I got my teaching credential, just working with kids and after school programs, making sure that's what I really wanted to do. Really wanted to I, do. Yeah. yeah. And I loved it. And yeah, I guess the rest is, is history. <laughs> That's awesome. That's pretty wise of you to take that year to really decide. Cause I've seen a number of educators from either my time teaching or working at a district office, or even now that have come in with a certain ideal of what being an educator is like, and then they get there and that ideal is ripped down pretty quickly. Um, everybody, I mean, it's, I mean, you know this because you've worked with teachers for over 15 years. Everyone, I don't care how great of a teacher you are, has that first and second year, like, oh my God, can I do this? Am I enough? All of those moments. Right. Did what you did have I get those? <laughs> yeah. Did you have those early on as you started? Is that something that you had to go through or did that year give you a really good transition? You know, luckily, I do feel like I was very lucky in the sense of I had great um, master teachers when I was doing my student teaching. Um, I felt like yeah. that did help build my confidence a lot. But absolutely. I mean, those first couple of years, it's really sink or swim. You're just, you know, trying to get your bearings and, you know, figure out what works for you. Um, It's I kind of think of it, too, as like when you first become a parent, you know, you're getting a lot of information thrown at you, sometimes a lot of conflicting information and you want to do a good job. You want to do the best job that you can. Um, But a lot of times it's just a matter of trusting your gut and knowing what works for you and your students. And then I think with that, building that confidence over time, that knowing there's not just one right way to do things. um, It's really just using that judgment. Um, Just so the folks who are listening who don't know your story. So as you're teaching, you at some point get inspired to start creating resources, sharing resources. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey, when that happened for you, and kind of what your start was to really trying to help Uh, support other teachers? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I actually, I always just loved making things to use for my own students in my own classroom. Um, I'm sure as many teachers can relate to, you know, your uh, textbook curriculum doesn't have everything that you need. You often have to supplement. And so, you know, I would take a look at a math lesson or language arts lesson, and I would think, okay, how can I make this more engaging? How can I get my kids more excited about learning the skill? So I would make 
my own materials. And then again, as many teachers do, we share with each other. So I would share those materials with my grade level team, with other teachers. And someone just kind of made an offhanded comment to me one day. They said, you know, um, you should try making these available to other teachers online. You know, teachers pay teachers. A lot of people oh, yeah. <laughs> can, use, can use those materials. And I didn't think too much of it. But then, um, you know, later after my second daughter was born, um, again, being a mom is a big part of who I am. But I also felt like, you know, I think it would be nice too to have that creative outlet, kind of have something for yourself too. So I gave it a go. I put, you know, one... Um, you know, I set up my teacher's paid teacher store. I put one uh, resource up there and it just, it became almost addicting. I just loved it when you would get that feedback from other teachers saying, I loved using this in my class. So I felt like I was being of value. I was contributing in education in a way that was beyond um, just my own classroom. So I continued to make teaching materials. And then somewhere along the way, in that journey, I believe it was, it was actually the year, uh, the same school year that the pandemic hit. So before, you know, COVID was even on our radar, but at the very beginning of that school year, um, I was reading back to school books to my students. And I remember thinking, I wish I had a book to them that I could read about being a class family, because I would mm. often, just like many teachers do, I would often tell my kids that we were like a family. You know, we spend a lot of time with each other every day. You know, we're actually spend, if you think about it, more time with each other than we do with our own families at home during the yep. course of the day. And so um, I often feel that picture books are a good way to uh, relay a message to kids. And so I even went online, I looked for a book like that. I <laughs> I went on Amazon, I went to my you know local Barnes and Noble and I searched, I was like class family book, but I couldn't find one because it didn't exist. And so I thought, you know, I thought about the materials that I make for teachers. Um, one of my favorite childhood authors, Beverly Cleary, I thought of one of her most famous things that she said, which was, if you don't see the book that you want on the shelves, write it. And so mm. I thought, well, you know, I've, I've always loved to read and to write when I was a kid. As I said, science was not my strength, but I did always love um, writing. And so I thought, well, why don't I give it a try? And worst case scenario, if it's not useful for other teachers, it's just, it's a book that I want to read to my class. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. if anything, it will be that. Um, but, you know, I did end up sharing it with other teachers. I did get a very positive response. And I think because that particular year uh, with the pandemic hitting, it took on a whole new meaning that um, that idea of being a class family and sticking together, even when you get curveballs thrown at you, times change, but you stick together. And so I think that resonated um, with a lot of other educators as well. So we'll dive into your latest book here in a minute, but let's let's start with this one. And if someone is listening and thinking, oh, it's okay, so we build a class family. I know you've got activities to go with it and all that, but like just the book itself, what are the key components that you're helping build or you're helping create um, in terms of the culture that you're creating within a classroom because they read the book and engage in the book? Right, absolutely. So I think a lot of times when teachers, educators, you talk about building positive relationships in the classroom, um, building a community in the classroom. We almost overthink it sometimes. You know, if you go online and you type in class community activities, building connections in the classroom, you are going to go down a big rabbit hole of, you know, morning meeting activities, All you know, and all of that is fantastic. Absolutely. I think it's great to be intentional with your time because you're, you know, you're, Constantly, you have so much on your plate in terms of the curriculum you have to teach. So it can be hard to remember, oh, yes, we need to go back and also continue to do team building activities and all of that. Yeah. So absolutely important. Um, but I guess when I say we overthink it sometimes, a lot of times it's really just those small everyday interactions that you have with your kids, making each other feel special, being respectful with one another. 
Um, you know, when a kid tells you something about, you know, something at home, like, oh, I'm having a soccer game or, you know, following up and asking them, how was your soccer game? You know, taking a genuine interest in who they are at school, but also outside of school. And so um, our class as a family, it really just focusing, uh, focusing on having that acceptance of one another, respecting each other. Um, it also talks about how in your class, you know, you're all going to have things that are similar, things you have in common, but you're also going to have a lot of differences, things that make you unique and just accepting those things about each other and having each other's backs, you know, out on the playground, you know, it's almost like treating each other, like I hate to say, but like siblings in a way, you know, you don't yeah. always belong. Sometimes there's going to be conflict. You're going to drive each other a little crazy sometimes, especially toward the end of the school year. But in the end, you truly care about one another and you're there for each other. Yeah. As you were saying that I was laughing, I've told the story a couple of times uh, in the last couple of years, but uh, you know, I got, the pictures behind me, I've got Luke who's nine and then Noah who's six. So third and first grade and they will fight. I, I will then punish one of them. And then the person that is not punished will get upset with me because I took away their buddy. And I thought I was trying to help them out. So I can only imagine how that shows up in your classroom on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, when you use this, I mean, obviously you started because you were looking for a book that you could read at the beginning of the year. Is this something that you generally would encourage people to revisit throughout the year to continue to have a conversation around? Yes, definitely. So like I said, I wrote it with back to school in mind. I was thinking it was a good way to kind of have um a starting off point or a jumping point where you could build right. a platform where you could build upon it. Um, but yes, the great thing I hear from a lot of teachers is that yes, they revisit it throughout the year. You know, they come back from winter break. Let's take the book out again. Okay, we just came in and everybody is having squabbles after recess, not getting along. Let's bust out the book. <laughs> um, I've heard yeah. too, a lot of teachers like to end the year with it as well. Um, it's kind of a nice way to tie everything together as it comes full circle. And I feel like the book can also take on a different meaning at the end of the year when you've spent the whole year together building those relationships versus when you're first starting out together. What other impacts have you noticed uh, what other teachers have given you or what you've seen uh, in terms of people who have utilized this book and the resources that you, they can get with it um, in terms of impacting their class culture or performance or something? You know, to be honest, more than I would have ever imagined, teachers are amazing in that they can take a, an idea or a book or just a concept and then they really build upon it and make it their own um you know some of the activities i have you know i've created them but then you know when i see pictures or videos of the way teachers have used them i think oh i would have never thought of doing it that way that's genius and then um like i said i think teachers just by nature they share with one another so you know it just kind of spreads and teachers can use it in their own ways for example i have um these bookmarks that say our class is a family on them. And I'm thinking in my head, oh, it'd be great, you know, for uh, teachers they can hand out it back to school or it could be an end of yeah. the year gift. And then I had a teacher who sent me a picture. She, she said, oh, look, I had my whole class, everybody signed their name on the back. Um, and then, you know, they got to keep it. She said the kids hung on to it the whole school year. You know, they're all tattered and ripping by the end of the year, but they became more treasured because they were signed um, by everybody in the class on the back. And I thought, what a great idea. Teachers can really just take something and add their own spin and their own personality to things. I love that. Is there grade levels that you uh, focus on with this book? Is it K-5? Can it? Have you heard it being utilized at middle school or high school level? Yeah. So um, like I said, I second grade is kind of my you know, right. <laughs> we're going to call it your happy place. <laughs> but um, I've heard, you know, classes as young as preschool, pre-K, TK reading the book. And awesome. I would have never imagined high school, but I have had high school teachers told me that they they have. And some high school teachers as well. A couple of my other books, um, A Letter from Your Teacher, one to be read on the first day of school and the last day of school. They said, even though, you know, it's a picture book. Um, it rhymes, very simple text, but the message um, still applies. And 
I'm a firm believer that you're never too old for a picture book. Picture books are for yeah. everyone. So it really made me excited when I heard that it was being used in middle school and in high school as well. Not as widespread, of course, as the elementary level, but I thought, again, that was something I didn't anticipate. And something else I didn't anticipate too was um, uh, parents in mind. So what was really neat as well is I've had a lot of um, moms, families reach out to me as well, telling me, oh, I, you know, I've read my books to my four-year-old before they start school. You know, they were really nervous or anxious about starting school for the first time. But when they see, um, you know, what a classroom can look like and how everybody's there for each other, it's like they're, they're home away from home, um, their family away from home. She, they've said that it's really helped ease their fears before starting school. And so that was, a uh, wonderful surprise as well um that i hadn't considered before that's awesome uh, i taught high school math and i would i would consider using that because i i love anything particularly a picture book where it kind of reminds you of a kid right and so you're you're getting kids to like get out of the normal grind that they're in at the high school and then to be able to look around and recognizing how important the community is and the culture is versus just you're here to learn the subject. It's like we're here to love each other. And through that, we can learn the subject way more powerfully if we have this trust and appreciation of each other, right? Oh, um, definitely. So I, I, I can see the power for it. So the other book, you know, I've saw that was uh, after teaching for a while, I, I moved to uh, the district office and oversaw a, a bunch of different schools. And so I'm really fascinated by your latest book, which is just a building off of a class as a family, which is uh, our school as a family. And so tell me about the genesis of that and tell me what is unique and powerful about this book. Yeah. So just piggybacking off of what you said about in your math class, how even with older kids, you know, it's there, you're there every day, that sense of community. But I think it can be so powerful to bring that to light and bring that to kids attention, especially in the younger grades. Um, you know, so our school as a family, it really builds upon that prior knowledge from having that sense of community within your classroom, but then building beyond that outside the classroom. So um, I've kind of talked about it as how you have your family at home that you live with, but then you also have your extended family. You know, you have aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, who are also still a big part of, you know, it takes a village, right, <laughs> with the kids. And yeah. it's the same at school, you know, um, as I address in the book, teacher, the teacher is who, you know, students are going to be visibly and physically seeing the most each day. But there are also a lot of other um, figures in a school who truly care about the kids at the school and are there to help. So obviously, you know, administrators, uh, school custodians, school secretaries, um, all the support staff, like speech pathologists, school counselors. So really just bringing those different roles to students' attention and knowing that, you know, they have the support in their classroom, but there's that extra security net, if you will, of other people who are there to help support their learning as well. Um, and I, I don't know, I envision it as being read in the classroom, of course, by a teacher, but I think it could also be extra powerful to have um, guest readers come into the classroom. You know, teachers might invite their principal to come read it. Um, they might invite um, yeah, any school staff, really, the school counselor, and it can be powerful, I think, for students to hear the, those same words from another staff member at the school, knowing that there's that sense of unity, that everybody has that same mindset at school, that they're there to help one another. And um, also address at the at, toward the end of the book, it's not just that all these staff members are here to help you um, kind of twist on the other end. What's the student's rule in a school family, you know, talks about um, simple things. When you see other people on campus, you know, you see the school custodian, say hi, say good morning. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to thank them for things. You can show them they're appreciated, you know, write them a thank you note. Um, what are some other ways? I, I also picture two teachers using it as a jumping off point, you know, so if they're reading about here's the school library, um, you know, so, okay, so what are some ways, here's how the school librarian helps us, how can we help her out, you know, taking good care of the books, using a quieter yes. voice when we're in the library, all those, I, I feel like it could be used well 
to um, preface those behavior expectations before, especially at the beginning of the year, before students visit all of those various places or have those interactions um, with school staff. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think I was very fortunate that in middle school and high school, uh, our custodian was just someone who took a huge interest in me. And he probably had just as big of impact on me as anyone else. And so that experience gave me a paradigm that I definitely would not have had an education without that experience, right? And so I started looking for everybody in my schools and how they impact. But I think often we get, you know, uh, education can be stressful. The jobs can be stressful. The focus, you know, for any of us, we can get tunnel vision on our role within the school and not think about the community and family as a whole. So the suggestion that you made, uh, which is where my head was going with it, is how do you bring in those folks, whether it's the bus driver, custodian, librarian, whoever, into the classrooms more so they can be seen as key parts of this education process and key members of this community, I just think is so, so, so powerful. And I'm excited to see what this book does for folks, because this is one of those things that I think that if kids, you know, as young as preschool, as you said, or even up to middle school and high school, as they're thinking about it, can start looking at their whole school community as a family, but also how do they help create that family as change agents? That's the powerful part for me. That makes me excited to hear you you say because yeah sorry I'm not being very articulate right now but um, no you're good I, ab- it- I absolutely that just makes me excited to hear because I resonate with that that's how I I feel about it too I might my hope with it is that it will really help no matter what type of community currently exists at a school whether it's already at that level or if you know it kind of needs more of a boost in terms of bringing bringing everyone together, no matter where a school is at currently, I'm hoping it will just help improve upon that. Even if it's in the seemingly small ways, like I said, those little interactions. I think if a kid is, you know, saying hello to someone who works at the school that they wouldn't have otherwise, I mean, it's those kinds of things that make a huge, huge difference in the school climate. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think, like I said, I I just feel like the schools, part of my job when I'm not doing the podcast is traveling around the different districts and schools uh, across the country. And I would say a common theme that I notice is that the schools that you walk in and get goosebumps as an educator, when you walk in, just know this is a special place. Every single one of them without fail Again, they're not all perfect places, but they operate as a family and as a honoring way of everybody is just as important in this family. It's not a hierarchical system. And so I really love the power of what you can do with this book. And I'm excited to see where this goes. As folks are trying to learn more about ordering your book, which I think they should all do if they're listening right now, uh, or your books, plural, but this one we're just talking about or finding out more about the resources you have, what's the best way for folks to engage with you? Best way to reach me is uh, through my website. Um, It's lifebetweensummers.com. And you can find everything there. I mean, my books, um, I have blog posts um, that explain how I use different materials um, in the classroom with lots of teaching ideas. Um, It's basically the hub of everything. Author visits, um, it's all, all there on my website. Well, that's exciting. I hope as folks are listening, I hope they're, they're brainstorming one, how to order this, get involved with your website, but also potentially figure out the author visits. I think that would be a lot of fun for you and for a lot of the schools and districts across the country. Oh, yes. I That's the highlight of my week, honestly, yeah. is to do those <laughs> author visits. I really, really enjoy getting to, because um, like I said, you know, um, a lot of times creating things, you know, you're writing books, create, you're behind a computer. So I love just getting out there with the kids. And the lady actually at my most recent one was laughing at me because they had the whole area up on the stage at the multi-purpose room really high up. And yep. there were all these... Um, uh, the fourth graders had just had their orchestra practice. So all the cellos and everything were on the ground. And they're like, it's okay though, because you can be up. I'm like, oh no, I want to be on the um down on the floor with the kids. Yes. I need to- <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm a teacher at heart. I don't want to be up up on the stage. I'm gonna be right there. It's almost like the in the classroom, you know, proximity. I'm walking up and down the the aisles yeah. like that. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So uh we we end 
all of our episodes the same way with rapid fire questions, just to get some more insight from you. And so the first question is, what is a daily habit or discipline that you use to be the best version of yourself? Having my coffee every morning? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my wife would answer as well. I got to start with that, you know, 6, 7 a.m. coffee for her. Yes, but no, I would say um, on a more serious note, probably... Um, doing the bedtime routine with my kids at home. I love just, you know, doing a story before bedtime, saying prayers and then tucking them in. And then after we put them to sleep, I like having just that, you know, a couple of hours before, uh, with just my husband and I, before we go to bed, even if it's just sitting on the couch, watching TV, just having that time to decompress at the end of the day, I think I need that to be, uh, to be my best self the next day again. I, I totally agree with that. All right. Uh, what's the most, uh, either not the most recent, but what's a recent book or just a book that you've read in your lifetime that's so powerful that you, you constantly find yourself recommending to folks or you want to recommend to folks? So I'll be honest, I've always been a big reader in these last couple of most recent years. I haven't made as much time for it as I would have liked. Uh, most yeah. recently, I've actually been reading uh, travel books. I love to travel. So anytime we go on a trip, um, you know, I'll get the Lonely Planet uh, <laughs> copy. But um, I will recommend, I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of teachers listening. I just read a, this is more of a picture book recommendation than um, a professional development type book, but it was right around Easter time. And many people may have heard of it because it is a, a bestseller, but um, it's called The Rabbit Listened. Very okay. simple book, um, but I thought it was fantastic. It was about um, a little kid who, you know, they have a problem and how are they going to address it? All the different animals come by trying to show them how to solve the problem. You know, you could get angry, you could do this. Everyone's trying to give different advice. And then um, toward the end, when the rabbit comes up, rabbit doesn't say anything, just sits next to them. The rabbit's just there to listen. So I just thought it had a really powerful message as far as how you can support and be there for someone. It doesn't mean always have to having to solve their problems for them, but just being there for them. I thought it was a really powerful picture book. That's awesome. First time a uh, picture book's been uh, used too, I think. So that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> So again, my, my oldest kids, but I always say Luke right now, as he's the one who started this question, which is what's your walk-up song. He's always interested in thinking about what's a motivational song that somebody goes to when they need to pick me up or something. And so um, I'm curious if you had that, what would your walk-up or motivational song be? Oh gosh, probably just something upbeat and positive. Um, I picture, remember when I played volleyball in high school, you know, when the team runs out, I always like when they play the walking on sunshine. It's just a happy song <laughs> to run out to. Um, like I said, I'm a little more on the shy side. I was always the teacher who, great in front of kids. I get nervous if I have to present at a staff meeting. Um, so, you know, you never want to get me up for karaoke, but if I did do karaoke with friends, our go-to song was also, um, always um, Build Me Up Buttercup. That everybody just oh, I love it. Everyone sings along to that one. <laughs> yeah, th those are both songs when you hear just even the title of the song, it puts you in a different emotion. And usually you can probably go to the last place you sang along with it or the last place you heard it. Exactly. Those just are great. Happy, just happy songs. <laughs> yeah, those are great. All right. Uh, last question. Um, you're someone who's, yeah, you know, an influencer, a thought leader in a lot of different ways. And so you're exposed to a lot of really cool people or insight. And so one question I like to ask is a pretty open ended question, which is what's one piece of advice that uh, you've come across recently or a quote you've seen recently or something along those lines that has hit you in a way that you just have to share with others of like, oh, this was profound, or I saw this quote, and I had to share this on Instagram. Um, anything like that hit you recently? It's a really great question. Um, like, there's a lot of different directions I could go in that. Um, but I would probably just say as far as advice, um, I know teachers, um, a lot of the times they feel like they need to take on everything themselves. You know, you're balancing so many different things all at yep. once. It's not always even about just teaching the kids. There's all these extras, you know, all the parent communication and the meetings and all of these things. And um, I think a lot of times teachers just have to remind themselves that and I like, you know, in the book, our school is a family, there are other people there to help uh, support. A lot of times it's just a matter of asking 
you know, I think teachers forget sometimes the different resources and um, different people who are willing to help that are at their disposal. So just not feeling like you have to do it all on your own. You know, you have classroom with kids with various degrees of needs, different academic needs, kids who need behavioral supports. Um, it's really important to remember it's not all on you. You know, it should be a, a team of people, parents, um, support staff, um, you know. And life between summers. Uh, <laughs> yes, to call, right? I'm, here, I'm here to help you out too. Yes. I know that's not, I know, I know you're <laughs> humble enough to, that's not where you're leaving at. I just wanted to make the plug for you. <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, no, that's so true because so often it feels, especially this time of year as you're, you're kind of wrapping up the school year, um, you know, there's some folks are just ready to get to summer already. And, um, it's, you, you kind of just feel like you're alone in the challenge. And to your point, you're just not, but you've got to put yourself out there with folks who want to help you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, Shannon, this was awesome. Thank you so much for making time for us. This was a real treat. Um, I'm looking forward to, seeing how many folks continue to to buy your books, but also really engage with your, you know, our school as a family book, because I think there's so much power in creating that type of community in every school that can unlock so many people's potential and joy in life that they haven't um, already tapped into. So I appreciate you. Uh, what's the, what's the uh, Beverly Cleary uh, quote? I'm gonna let you leave us with that one again, because I'm glad that you followed that. Oh, thank you. Yes, again, and I actually share this with kids all of the time too. I feel like it really um, has helped inspire them with the things that they want to write about too. Um, but again, that was just, if you don't see the book that you want on the shelves, write it. <laughs> I love that. And I appreciate the inspiration today. So again, thanks for making time for us. I wish you the best and hopefully our paths cross again soon. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, podcast on Apple or Spotify, and help us celebrate the beautiful, messy work of shaping human potential.